Hello and welcome back to All Things Marine Life. I'm your host, Caleb, and today we're exploring one of the ocean's most mesmerizing and enigmatic creatures, comb jellies, also known as tinafores. If you love glowing wonders, fascinating evolutionary tales, and extraordinary hunting techniques, you're in for a treat. We'll uncover how these gelatinous drifters may hold vital clues to the earliest chapters of animal evolution and why they become a hot topic in marine biology. So strap on your virtual diving gear and let's ride the shimmering ciliary combs of these captivating creatures. What exactly are comb jellies? At first glance, you might mistake comb jellies for jellyfish, but these are two distinct groups. Jellyfish are part of the phylum Cnidaria, famous for their stinging cells called cnidocytes. Meanwhile, tinafores belong to their own phylum, Tinophora. The major difference is that jellyfish have stinging cells called nidocytes, while comb jellies have sticky cells called coloblasts. If a jellyfish is like a taser, zapping its prey, then a comb jelly is like a big piece of ocean-grade flypaper capturing prey with sticky threads. Both are effective, but the comb jelly's method is a bit more... gluey. Tinafores are named for their eight rows of ciliated combs, which they use for locomotion. Each comb row is lined with thousands of tiny hair-like cilia that beat in a coordinated fashion, propelling the jelly through the water. These cilia are so reflective that when light hits them, you'll see little rainbow streaks rippling across the comb rows, like a prismatic disco light lighting up the ocean. They're among the largest organisms that primarily rely on cilia for movement, most other creatures rely on mussels or water currents to get around in the ocean. Now let's dive into the biggest evolutionary puzzle surrounding comb jellies. For a long time, scientists assumed sponges were the earliest branch in the animal kingdom, but recent genetic studies suggest that tinafores might actually be the first to split from the rest of the animal tree. This has sparked debate in a flurry of research papers because it challenges our understanding of how nerves, muscles, and even complex behaviors developed. It's like someone showing up at a family reunion with surprising DNA results saying, hey, I might actually be older than Grandpa Sponge. Mind blown, right? Within the phylum Tinophora, we have around 200 described species, but scientists suspect many more remain undiscovered, especially in the deep ocean. These species are generally split off into two major classes. First one being Tentaculata, which possesses tentacles or tentacle-like structures, and they use coloblasts on those tentacles to capture prey. The second class is going to be Nuda. There's no tentacles at all, and they typically swallow their prey whole, oftentimes others tinafores. Let's spotlight a handful of species that showcase the breadth of tinafore diversity. The sea gooseberry is a small spherical body with two retractable tentacles, and it feeds by using these thin tentacles to ensnare plankton, giving it the appearance of a gooseberry with trailing fuzz. It's often found in cold coastal waters like the northern Atlantic. The sea walnut is a notorious invasive species that invaded the Black Sea in the 1980s, leading to catastrophic declines in fisheries. Its diet consists of zooplankton, and it is an oval appearance, somewhat flattened body with four comb rows that are clearly visible. Any of the burrow species are going to be tinafores with no tentacles that belong to the class Nuda. They're also fearsome predators that prefer to consume other comb jellies by engulfing them whole. They're also known to be bioluminescent, and many species can glow in the dark to confuse predators or lure prey. Any of the Leucothea species are graceful and ribbon-like flattened bodies that drape through the water resembling transparent silk. Their habitat consists of tropical and subtropical seas, often near the surface at night. Bathocyro fosteri is a deep sea dweller found thousands of meters below the surface, and it has a bright red hue. When it's illuminated by submersibles, they can appear vividly red or pink in color. They're rarely seen, and each new sighting excites deep sea explorers. You might think these transparent blobs just float around helplessly, but comb jellies are actually skilled predators. Their main weapons include coloblasts, which are sticky cells on their tentacles or their bodies, and expansive mouths. Species like burrow species can devour other tinafores in a single gulp. Picture a never-ending buffet where you can't say no. Tinafores basically move through the water, scooping up tiny snacks as they go. If they're a burrow species, they'll happily treat their cousins as the main course. By controlling zooplankton populations, comb jellies play an important role in marine food webs. However, overpopulations of some species like the sea walnut can spell trouble for ecosystems that aren't used to their insatiable appetite. 
Comb jellies inhabit every ocean from the Arctic to the tropics to the deep sea. You'll often find dense populations near coastlines or in places where upwelling brings nutrient-rich water to the surface, offering a buffet of plankton. Some species thrive in partially salty, partially fresh waters, kind of like estuaries. They're also sometimes an invasive species. For example, Monopsis laidii famously invaded the Black Sea, contributing to an ecosystem collapse for local fisheries. Similar invasions have been observed in the Caspian Sea and parts of Europe. Marine scientists keep tabs on comb jelly blooms because they can indicate shifts in water temperature, salinity, or nutrient availability, often tied to climate change and human activities like overfishing. Most tenophores are simultaneous hermaphrodites, meaning they produce both eggs and sperm at the same time. This allows them to self-fertilize if no other comb jellies are around. A single comb jelly can produce thousands of eggs per day under the right conditions, making them prolific breeders and helping them to colonize new areas very quickly. There's really three development stages that comb jellies have. First is the egg, second is the larval or the sedipid stage, which looks very much like a mini version of the adult, and then finally the adult phase, where they have fully developed comb rows and, if applicable, tentacles. In aquariums, comb jellies can unexpectedly burst into large populations, which surprises aquarists who weren't prepared for a nursery of little jellies floating around. It's like hosting a party and realizing all your guests decided to bring their thousands of kids too. Many comb jellies produce bioluminescence, glowing green, blue, or even rainbow colors in the dark. When something bumps into them, be it a predator, prey, or a curious diver, they might light up like tiny neon ghosts. They can use it for defensive reasons, startling predators or diverting them. They can also use it for camouflage by using it to produce light and break up a silhouette, making them harder to spot by visual hunters. Some researchers speculate they could lure smaller creatures intrigued by the glow. It's like a silent fireworks show that only goes off when someone accidentally steps on the firecracker. Amazing to watch, but a bit startling if you're not expecting it. Tenophores are quickly becoming a hot topic in biology because of what they might tell us about the origin of animal life and the evolution of nervous systems. Their nerve nets and muscle cells appear distinct from those of other animals, suggesting multiple independent origins of complex systems or a very ancient blueprint of them. Recent areas of study include genome sequencing, where several comb jelly species' genomes have been mapped, offering clues about novel genes and proteins. Neurobiology, investigating how comb jellies coordinate complex behaviors without a true brain. Bioluminescence, potential biomedical and industrial applications for the glowing proteins. Imagine harnessing the natural glow of tenophores for medical imaging or environmental monitoring. These are still theoretical concepts, but the possibilities spark excitement among researchers. Comb jellies aren't as directly threatened by human activity as some marine megafauna like sharks or sea turtles. However, they're still influenced by overfishing because it removes fish that might otherwise compete with or prey on comb jellies, potentially boosting tenophore numbers. Climate change, warmer waters, and changing currents can extend their breeding seasons or expand their range, leading to more frequent blooms. Habitat alterations, pollution, and other environmental disturbances can skew plankton populations in ways that favor certain comb jellies. In some regions, explosive comb jelly populations can deplete zooplankton, harming local fisheries and biodiversity. Balancing ecosystems means understanding all players, including these shimmering gelatinous ones. Let's take a quick pit stop for some rapid fun fire facts. Let's take a quick pit stop for some rapid fire fun facts about these glow in the dark ocean drifters. They lack a centralized brain, yet they can coordinate complex feeding and swimming behaviors through a decentralized nerve net. Some species can also mature in just two weeks, rapidly colonizing new habitats. Many tenophores can regenerate lost body parts, and tentacles can regrow quickly if damaged. Depending on species and conditions, lifespans in tenophores can range from a few months to over a year. Fossil records of tenophore-like creatures date back more than 500 million years, possibly outdating even some sponges. Before we wrap up, here are a few burning questions people often have about comb jellies. Are comb jellies harmful to humans? Most species pose no risk to humans because they lack stinging cells. Their sticky tentacles might feel like a mild contact, but nothing like a jellyfish sting. Can we keep them in aquariums? Some public aquariums do keep comb jellies in special tanks with gentle currents. They're tricky to keep because they're very delicate and require a constant supply of the right plankton. 
Why the huge blooms sometimes? Blooms can occur when conditions like temperature, salinity, and plankton availability are ideal for comb jellies. Lack of natural predators or competition can cause populations to skyrocket. What happens if a predator bites them? Their gelatinous body can simply slip away from partial bites, and many species can regenerate quickly. It's like having a built-in reset button. From their sticky tentacles to their rainbow combs, and from their ancient evolutionary roots to their ultra-modern scientific significance, comb jellies prove that nature still has plenty of surprises up its sleeve. Whether they are peacefully gliding in shallow waters or roaming the deep sea, these tinafores remain a testament to the beauty and mystery of marine life. If you've enjoyed this deep dive, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and share it with anyone else who's fascinated by marine life. And if you've ever encountered a comb jelly in the wild or have questions about them, drop a comment down below. I'd love to hear your stories and questions.